New servers use so much power that low power racks simply can't handle them anymore. Instead, from hyperscalers to home labbers, folks are turning to single socket servers as the solution. While we were testing the new single socket Intel Xeon servers, we found something absolutely crazy. These new chips don't just offer 50% more cores or 200 megabytes more level three cache, they offer more performance and at a lower IO power consumption? That made absolutely no sense, so we had to go test it out. So let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we have something that is absolutely wild. How this all came about is that we were installing new servers into some of our lower power racks, but to hit the number of nodes that we needed for a cluster, we had to scale back and use single socket CPUs and single socket servers instead. And since I like the idea of testing before we deploy, I wanted to test not just the AMD solutions, but also the Intel solutions. Now, Intel definitely saw the fact that AMD has the P series of single socket CPUs, but at the same time, Intel said, hey, we need something to compete, and they came out with their U series. So a lot of folks don't even know this because they're not really marketed that much, but Intel actually has single socket only processors that are designed literally for these single socket servers. And since nobody had done this before, I called up Intel and I said, hey, look, can I get the fourth generation highest core count single socket CPU, which is the Intel Xeon Gold 6414U, and also the fifth generation Intel Xeon Platinum 8558U CPUs, because I wanna show the difference in the fourth gen versus fifth gen Intel Xeon on scalable single socket solutions. And Intel was initially a little skeptical, but eventually they did end up sending these CPUs. We do have to say that this video is sponsored by Intel 100%, but we get to maintain editorial control. And let me prove that to you very easily. If you want the highest spec int rate score in a single socket server, then you're probably gonna buy an AMD Epic Bergamo and put that in a single socket server. Those things are you know, over $10,000 a piece, but they are faster 100% than any of the CPUs that we're gonna look at today. Instead of getting the maximum per socket performance, Intel's really focused more on getting higher performance per core. Whether you have VMware licensing, Microsoft Windows Server licensing, or anything like that, where you are licensed on a per core basis, those are the applications that really can benefit by having fewer cores, but higher performance cores, because you end up spending way more on license than you do on the server hardware itself. So it's under that theory that we decided to go test this. And when we tested it, we found something completely unexpected, or at least maybe we should have expected it, but nobody talks about it. The new Emerald Rapids or fifth gen Intel Xeon scalable processors use significantly less power at idle. And you also get more performance, even though they're using the exact same core. And that is the rabbit hole that we found. And we went into pretty darn far and we found some really cool stuff. So let's get to it. And let's start with how these chips are even made. Now we already have an in-depth article on the STH main site, as well as a video that we'll link in the description. So if you wanna get into the weeds of how these processors are made, well, that's a good place to start. But something to remember is that the fourth generation Intel Xeon Scalable, codenamed Sapphire Rapids, was a generation where Intel really started getting into the idea of having multiple compute tiles. For lower core count parts, there was a MCC die, which had up to 32 cores, and that also carries forward into the fifth generation of Intel Xeon Scalable. But the one that's more exciting, at least to me, is the XCC die, where you have four pieces of silicon arranged and connected onto a single package. And by far, one of the biggest changes with the 5th Gen Xeon Emerald Rapids processors is that they only use two compute dies. So instead of having to make little EMIT bridges between four compute tiles, you have only two compute tiles in the fifth generation. And Intel was very open with us saying, hey, look, the reason we did this is it's easier to manufacture because we have fewer pieces of silicon. And it's also a lower power design because we don't have those higher power EMIT bridges to get data from one compute tile across over to another compute tile, or at least they don't have to do it as many times. Okay, so to test this, I really wanted to look at the single second processors. And so what we have is an Intel Xeon Gold 6414U. Now this is a 32 core 64 thread processor. It has 60 megabytes of level three cache and it has 250 watt TDP. You would think that this is gonna be the lowest power part of our total roundup, but you might be surprised about what you actually see. While that Xeon Gold is an example of the fourth gen XCC, I also wanted to look at what happens when we get to the fifth generation, we go from that four die to two die design. That's why we have the Intel Xeon Platinum 8558U. 
Now this is a 48 core processor, 96 threads. So it certainly has another 50% more cores than in the previous generation, which is pretty awesome itself. The TDP went up by about 20%. So we now have a 300 watt TDP, but you might think that it's a higher power part. And that is why you definitely need to go stay and watch the power consumption section because it's going to just totally blow your mind. But the other side to it is that we have 260 megabytes of level three cache because the higher core count parts for Emerald Rapids tended to have higher cache capacity as well. Now, I know a lot of folks are going to say, hey, these are single socket processors, but what about a dual socket processor or dual socket capable processor, higher TDP, all that kind of stuff. So we also have is another 58 series processor, but of course, a fourth generation Intel Xeon Scalable, which is a Xeon Platinum 8458P processor. Now, of course, on the AMD side, that P would indicate that it's a single socket processor. But again, Intel uses U for uniprocessor there. So this is a processor you could also use in a dual socket server. Now, of course, having a single socket processor means that you don't have a high power UPI link between the two sockets, but you also don't necessarily need to have that active. So with that, we have our three processors, but I think we should start looking at the performance of the processors. Okay, so let's talk about the performance of these different CPUs really quickly. Now, a couple things here. First off, we get 50 watts more TDP with the new parts versus the old parts. So we would expect that we could get a little bit higher clock speed, but you're not gonna get 20% more performance just based on that extra 20% TDP. It's more like, you know, you get a couple percent more performance just based on that expanded TDP. Both the 6414U as well as the 8558U have two gigahertz base clocks, but the Xeon Gold only has 3.4 gigahertz as its max clock, whereas you can boost up to four gigahertz on the new fifth gen part. But by far, the biggest thing is the fact that the new part has up to 48 cores versus 32 cores. Now, I do want to point out that if you do want to have 32 cores, you can actually increase the TDP per core and also the clock speed by using one of the profiles that's in the 8558U. 32 cores is a supported profile. And overall, the new chip just completely trounces the old one. I mean, it's not even close. We're talking about 60, 70% more performance, even with only 50% more cores. Now, the one thing I wish that these chips had in the worst way was I wish that they had more of the things like quick assist, acceleration, and all that kind of stuff. While you do get the on-chip features like AMX, things like quick assist, you don't get those accelerators on the single socket parts. And we've done a deep dive onto those accelerators that you can find below. Still, from a raw compute perspective, you're getting a lot more in the new generation. And so the thought was, well, what about the power consumption? Is this something that Intel is just juicing the power consumption? something like crazy to go and get more performance. And we found out that the answer to that is absolutely not. In fact, it's kind of the opposite when we get down to idle. Now, one of the most challenging parts of this entire test setup was just really figuring out what the test setup should be. So that way we could find out if there are variations between the different chips. Now, this is a super micro server that I think we did a review of last May. So about a year ago during the Sapphire Rapids generation. And since we've been looking at single socket servers for some of our own low power racks, we have one of these and I just kind of said, okay, well, let's use that as our test case. Now with that, we had to go and do three different processor options. And just saying that we would swap out three different CPUs was clearly not enough for what we were about to do. Instead, the idea was we needed to get to what the difference was on the CPU side. Okay, so let's kind of go through some of the modifications we did to get this to something that we could actually see the CPU power consumption, because these are all really important. The first thing we did was we removed half of the memory. So instead of having all 16 DDR5 memory slots all set up and ready to go and being used, we're only using eight. Now, eight is important because that's how many memory channels we have. So we are getting full memory bandwidth. We're just using half the number of DIMMs. It also means though that we have half the capacity. So we only have 256 gigabytes of memory rather than 512 gigabytes. The reason we did that is because a 32 gig DDR5 DIMM can use maybe just over a watt or so at idle, but can go up to about five watts in total power consumption. So removing that kind of gives us a little bit less power and lets us isolate the power of the CPU as best we can. Now we could have gone down to one DIMM and doing that would lower the overall power consumption of the entire system, especially at idle. The negative with doing that though, is that you're not getting full memory bandwidth and therefore not getting full performance. Also some of our benchmarks just wouldn't run if we had a single memory channel installed. So that's a really good reason that we only have eight DIMMs in the system rather than just one or 16. The other modification was an important one. We pulled out some additional NICs. 
So we had OCP NIC 3.0 cards in this. We had an Intel E810, so I think that was a 25 gig network card. And then we also had a NVIDIA 200 gig NIC, and we have reviews of these, of course, on the STH main site. We can link those down below if you want. But those NICs can generally use somewhere in maybe the 10 to 20 watt range, even without optics. So that's something that, you know, just pulling that out gets you about 30 watts lower. That again, allows us to isolate and see the CPU better. The next modification we made was also pulling out a lot of the storage. We have a single Kyoxia CM6, I think, SSD in there. And the reason that we're using the Kyoxia CM6 is because, well, we had a bunch of them on the shelf and that's what we decided to use. Now, you could go, of course, fill out more SSDs, but if you only have a single SSD, it allows you to go boot and again, isolate that CPU performance or CPU power more effectively. It would have been actually lower power had we used an M.2 SSD, but I felt like let's just go use an enterprise drive literally because, well, it was on the shelf. There are, however, a couple things in the system that I do want to point out that I, we just don't have any control of, right? First off, there's a BMC, an A-Speed AST 2600 BMC, which is kind of down in this area over here. That BMC is something that everybody loves because you have IPMI access and all that kind of stuff. You do add a band. You don't have to be sitting at the loud server and all that kind of stuff, but it also uses somewhere in that like five to seven watt range typically. So even at idle, you're going to have five to seven watts on a server just for that BMC. And often, even if that server is turned off, that BMC is still running. Another thing we couldn't change was the chipset. But of course, if you have an Intel Xeon platform, you're going to have a chipset anyway, something we can't change until the next generation when those go away. So at this point, we have a pretty bare bones configuration, but we had one major problem, and that's we needed some way to go and get network access. Now, I didn't want to necessarily use the BMC because that's kind of a funky way to go do it. It's just such a pain. So uh, instead, what we did was we literally used a USB NIC. Yes, you can use a two and a half gig USB NIC. Uh, this is from Asus. And you just kind of plug it in there and uh, you know that gives you your two and a half gig network connection. Now, once all of this was done, it was time to start swapping CPUs and seeing a couple things. One, what was the idle power consumption? Two, what was the load power consumption? And we wanted to look at that not just in terms of the overall system or overall server. We also wanted to see what the package power consumption was. Okay, so starting out, let's start with the processor that we had in there originally, the Intel Xeon Platinum 8458P. When we had this installed, we could see that the package power consumption was about 88 watts. The overall server power consumption at idle was about 150 watts. Now this is a 350 watt TDP CPU. So of course, when we went and decided to go run this thing using a stress NG, we got that 350 watts at the package power consumption. At the wall, however, this went all the way up to 550 watts. And just to give some idea, that would be about equivalent to a dual Skylake or Cascade Lake Xeon server if you had it configured in a pretty minimal-ish like design, kind of like we would have there. And you also had higher end, like 24 core parts or something like that. So you had a similar core count. So again, if you were just trying to go and take a first or second gen Xeon scalable server and consolidate it into a fourth gen or fifth gen, that's a pretty decent option. And it's about equivalent from a dual socket server to a single socket server. Next though, we said, hey, what if we actually went and we got the less expensive processor, the Intel Xeon Gold 6414U. Now this is only a 250 watt TDP processor, which means that the overall, like, we would expect 100 watts at least less at a system power consumption level and also at a package power consumption level. But at idle, things tend to be not that different. So the idle power consumption was 81 watts at the package. The server power consumption was 138 watts, but that means from the CPU package perspective, we were about seven watts less using the lower core count, lower power part, but at the overall server level, it was about 12 watts less. Now, something just kind of interesting was that our server generally ran this processor under load at somewhere in 238 to 240 watts, not a full 250 watts, which is a little bit weird, but that's just kind of the behavior. So we're just going to report what we saw. The overall system power consumption was about 380 watts and 380 watts for a, you know, single socket servers. It's not too bad. It's definitely if you have two 16 core first or second gen Xeon scalables, that's, that's about what you would see in a server like this. But next, what happens when we go to the fifth gen? Intel Xeon scale. Now remember, part of what Intel told us was that we should get lower power on Emerald Rapids than we got on Sapphire Rapids. So this should be a lower power part, but on the flip side, it also has a lot of cores and it's also a 300 watt TDP part, which is right in between the other two SKUs that we tested. 
So when we fired this up, it was only 67 watts at idle. And that's a full 14 watts less than the Xeon Gold that we tested for the previous generation. We were expecting that Xeon Gold actually to be less than this Emerald Rapids, but that was totally incorrect. So while the package was only 67 watts, the overall system power consumption was 122 watts. So that means that we have gotten more cores, we've gotten way more cash, and we've also lowered our idle power consumption significantly. Now, when we put this under load, the CPU, of course, hit about 300 watts, which is what we would expect from a 300 watt TDP CPU. The overall server, though, hit about 465 watts, which is about what we would expect. And it's somewhere in the mid range of the Xeon Platinum and Xeon Gold from the previous generations. So guys, this is super exciting. And let's put this into a little bit of perspective. We got 50% more cores. We also have way more cash. And at the same time, we have lowered our idle power consumption of both the server as well as the just CPU package itself. And even comparing higher core count to higher core count, we got a massive savings on the new Emerald Rapids generations. It's just cool to see that that manufacturing change that Intel made actually netted out and gave them a better power consumption profile for a lot of servers. Okay, now with all of these videos, I like to have key lessons learned. And like, what did we learn from this? Finding the idle power consumption was so much lower in the Emerald Rapids generation, I think is awesome. If you're a company that's deploying these servers today as a high-end solution or something like that, this might be interesting to you just because that might save you a little extra power. It also seems like some of that extra power that's not going to having multiple dies is actually being used for the compute side. And that's what's giving us more performance. And hey, let's go forward in time, circular economy. Let's talk about what happens a couple years down the road. Now we're just about at the Intel Xeon 6 launch where we're gonna have 144 cores in like like a month and change in, in a single socket, right? So that's gonna change the game in terms of core count, although those may not necessarily be as fast per core as what we're looking at here. That also means that in three years, you're gonna see core counts absolutely explode into having hundreds of cores per socket. So looking at something today where you're gonna have maybe, you know, 48 cores or something like that, that's not gonna seem like a big CPU. It's also gonna be a lower power CPU. And it's something that people might wanna go and buy on the secondhand market, just have a lower power, decently fast processor. And if you're a home labber, that's like buying a Skylake or a Cascade Lake. So first gen or second gen Intel Xeon scalable processor as we're publishing this video. They're just a lot less expensive because they're used and core counts have increased so rapidly. Whether this is for a lower power cluster today or a future lab cluster, I think that we found some interesting things in terms of performance and power consumption on these single socket solutions from Intel. But of course, all is not perfect. I wish that these had things like quick assist accelerators. Like this would be super cool if we could have an 800 gigabit per second quick assist accelerator built into this thing. People would use these things, I think like crazy if that were the case. But of course, this is one that I wanna hear what you guys think about this. Because to me, this is interesting because we test all this stuff, but I'd like to hear what you think. I mean, we're, we're literally deploying single socket servers every month these days. And I'd love to hear if you guys are doing the same or if you think that this is silly and we should just do dual socket servers forever. If you did like this video because we found some really cool new stuff, well, why don't you share it with your friends and colleagues, but also give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.